So assumption. Assumption is a thing that is accepted as true or as certain to happen without proof. We make assumptions every day without ever realizing that we're doing it. Uh, when we leave our house in the morning, we assume that we're going to return to it that night. We assume that our paychecks are going to be on time waiting for us. We assume that things we've grown accustomed to and have accepted as true will happen. But what if they don't? A few years ago, my ophthalmologist told me I had cataracts but that they were in the back of my eyes and he didn't anticipate having to do anything about them. And that sounded really good to me. <laughs> so I just assumed that I was going to escape having to have surgery. In the meantime, he retires. And I got a new ophthalmologist, and when I say new, I don't mean new to the profession, I mean new to the office, to, to us. And when uh, she came in, she told me that I would have to have cataract surgery. And I, I was taken aback. I was <laughs> really surprised because I was not expecting to hear that at all. I knew others who had had cataract surgery and who had talked about it. And, and the way that they described it, they really couldn't see very well at all. Their vision had really been impaired. And mine just wasn't, or I didn't think it was. I, I really didn't think it was that bad. I, yes, I knew I had to have glasses to read and to work on the computer and night driving was becoming a little more difficult for me. But I just thought that was part of the aging process. And um, I, I had made the assumption that I was going to be fine, that I would not have to have surgery, that my sight was really not that bad. But thank God for the doctor. I had the surgery. And what a difference it made. My assumptions were so wrong. I couldn't believe the difference after the surgery that it made to my eyesight. The world was clear again. I could read the small print at the doctor's office on that little screen that they test you with. I hadn't been able to do that even with my glasses for a long time. I had not been blind, but my vision had been impaired. After the surgery, I realized the brightness and the color that I had been missing. That experience made me appreciate my sight even more, and it also made me appreciate the doctors and their knowledge and their talents even more. Though I was not blind, my experience made me much more aware of how the blind man in today's scripture must have felt when the ultimate doctor, Jesus, gave this man sight. Often, when we think about Jesus' ministry, often he is walking, just walking along with his disciples, and he seems to walk into the situation that requires his attention. So is that coincidence or not? I think not. Today we're talking about a blind man that requires attention. The first question that the disciples asked Jesus when they saw this man was, who sinned? Whose fault was this? The parents or him? Well, the assumption was that the blind man, his, his blindness was caused by somebody. It was somebody's fault, but whose? Let's, let's think of whose this fault could be. 
And the man was born blind, so the assumption was that it had to be the parents. Because how could a child in the womb have caused his own blindness? What kind of sin would he have committed in the womb to cause his blindness? So it had to be the parents' fault. The assumption then is that God punishes people if we make him angry or if we sin. So when I think about the disciples' immediate assumption that someone was at fault, I think about how easily we make those same assumptions today. A child is born with a disability, and the immediate question is, what happened? Did the parents smoke? Or did they drink? Or did mom not take her vitamins? Or maybe not make the doctor's visits? We assume that someone did something wrong to cause this disability. Our thoughts are that bad things happen. They don't just happen, I'm sorry, that they don't just happen. There has to be a reason why they happen. And in biblical times, the assumption was bad things happen because someone sinned or made God angry. I stand here today and I tell you emphatically that that is not true. God is not a vengeful God and he does not cause bad things to happen. We live in a fallen world and life happens. And yes, sometimes when life happens, we must learn to live the very best life that we can, giving God glory, knowing God is with us, every step of the way. Now Jesus answered the disciples' question. Neither the blind man nor his parents sinned, caused the blindness. And then Jesus continued with the why part of the question, so that the glory of God could be revealed through him. So if we seek God through the pain and the suffering that happens in our lives, God can use us to bring glory to God by drawing us closer in our relationship with God and we learn to be more dependent on God. We have a nephew who was born much too early and he was born with several defects and not expect to live but a few short years. He is now in his 30s, and I have to give his mom so much credit because she has helped him live his very best life. He plays sports, he participates in Special Olympics, and she has always included him in all family functions. She brings him to everything. Now, this is not always easy because he has days when life is very hard and he reacts and not always in the best way. Nick's birth defects were not anyone's fault. Life happened. Every day is a challenge for him and his mom. But our niece's faith is strong. And through both of them, we see God's glory at work. Job suffered much. The loss of family, wealth, position, health. But still he remained faithful. Even though his wife said, curse God and die, when Job's three friends came to comfort him, they wept at the sight of him. And then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, not saying a word because of his condition and his suffering. When Job agonizes over his situation to his friends, they respond with, Job, you must be suffering because of some terrible sin that you have committed. Now just think of that. You're in such pain. Things have happened that 
no one else could really understand. You look to your friends to give you a little comfort, perhaps a hug, something, and they look at you and they say, well, it's your fault you're in this condition because you must have really sinned. How hurtful that would be. Job's assumptions were that his suffering was caused by something that he did. And the truth is that it wasn't Job's sin that caused God to draw Satan's attention to him. It was Job's faithfulness to God. Job was being tested in a mighty way. And what about Joseph? He was spoiled. He was the favorite son of Jacob. And we know that he was a bit full of himself. And he liked to flaunt in front of his brothers. But for all of his faults, Joseph's sufferings were not caused because of his sin. You see, his brothers had had enough of him. And they did not like hearing that someday they would be bowing down to their youngest spoiled rotten brother. Jealousy caused them to sell Joseph into slavery. And Joseph could have assumed that God was angry at him, that God was turning away from him, causing him to be in bondage. But we know that God had a plan for Joseph. And because Joseph was a willing and faithful servant, believing there had to be a reason for his plight, God's plan to keep an entire nation from starvation came to pass through his servant Joseph. For all his faults, Joseph loved God, and God's glory was revealed through him. Is God even, is God good even when life isn't? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Is God good even when life isn't? Max Lucado writes a, a phrase, quid pro quo, it's a Latin phrase, and roughly translated it means this for that. Many people approach life with this theory. Everything is a negotiation. You do this, and I'll do that. Marriages can, and they do function with that uh, approach. You cook, I'll clean. Business partners, they can function. Some friendships can resolve around revolve around that premise, you do this and I'll do that. For some people, quid pro quo makes the world go round. But here is the problem. Max writes, when a spouse does not uphold his or her part of the bargain, then all bets are off. When a business partner is not producing the goods, it might be time to offload them. When a friend is not measuring up as we think they should, we can find ourselves moving on to greener pastures. Max continues, nowhere is this kind of thinking more dangerous than when we try to import it into our relationship with God. God, if you keep me healthy, I will follow you. If you keep my, me financially stable, then I will share with others. Protect my family from harm, and I will follow you. But when one or more of these requirements fail, what then? Is God still good? To quote a song, God never promised us a rose garden. God never promised 
that we would go through life without any trials. He did promise to always be with us through those trials. I think I can safely say that most of us have areas in our lives that we like to keep hidden. We don't want to share those things with others. We don't want others to know that they exist. The problem is we think we can keep it a secret from God. And when we do that, those things continue to fester. They become an irritation in our lives. They hurt, much like a boil would hurt. You see, we have no secrets from God. We only think that we do. If we allow God to treat those places that we think are secret, we can then be healed. The blind man in today's scripture was born blind. He had never seen anything in his life. He had never seen his parents' face or his home. He would only know what color the sky was or the color of a flower if someone had taken time to explain it to him, to describe. Jesus walked to the blind man. See, the blind man couldn't see Jesus, but he could hear him. Jesus spat on the ground. He made some mud. And then he put that mud that he'd made with his saliva on the blind man's eyes. And he told the man to go and to wash in the pool of Siloam. For the first time in his life, the man could see. See, he, he hadn't had ever had sight, so this was all brand new to him. It wasn't repairing sight, it was giving sight. He could see his parents' faces for the very first time. He could see the birds that he'd only heard sing. He could see the faces and place them with the voices that he'd heard as they passed by him. Life changed for this man. The blind man was given sight. So think of the rejoicing that had to have been happening. And yet, not everyone rejoiced with him. Even though the man insisted, it is me, I am the one who is blind, not everyone believed him. You see, there's also a thing known as situational blindness. The man's own neighbors didn't recognize him. Is this the blind beggar? Some said yes. Others said no. How long had they passed by this man as he begged? How long had they lived near him? You know, we don't know the answers to those. Scripture doesn't tell us. What we know for sure is that this man knew who he was. How could they not know? After however long they had passed this man by, and the answer is because they never really looked at him. They had a picture in their minds of who this blind man was. This uh, beggar, a picture of who he was and where he belonged. And in their minds, he belonged on the corner begging. Years ago, I worked with an engineer really nice man, we became friends. We talked about our families and our interests. And he was in an accident, going home, a car accident, going home from work one night. 
a deer ran into his car, and the deer was lifted and pushed through his windshield, and when that happened, the hoofs of the deer hit him in the face. It caused a tremendous amount of damage to this man. And when he went to the hospital after he went, they had to do surgery on him. Um, and when he healed, his face had changed. He looked different. So when he came back to work, in my heart, I knew who this man was. But my eyes weren't so sure because he looked different than he did before the accident. So it took me a little while to adjust to this new him. When we see someone with limited vision, we only appreciate one very small aspect of who they are. My friend was more than his face. Lord, open our eyes and help us to see our neighbors in their fullness, not in what we have imagined them to be. Sometimes, even though we have sight, we fail to see correctly. We make assumptions that if they are blind, they must also be deaf, or if they are deaf, they must be blind. We talk about them right in front of them as if they couldn't hear us. The blind beggar was right there as they discussed whether or not it was really him. As though the man didn't know who he was. There was nothing wrong with this man's mind. He had been blind, but he knew who he was. The Pharisees judged Jesus on assumptions, didn't they? They had a long list of rules, things that you can or you cannot do based on traditions. Now, Jesus didn't follow their rules. And as a result, if you read on in John uh, 9, we see that the Pharisees accused Jesus of not being from God. Verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? You see, they were divided in what they thought was right. These Pharisees who thought they were always right. Now, we have many different churches in our world, many different denominations, and many ways in which we worship. But if we worship as Holy Spirit leads, and the teaching is biblically sound, then is it not from God? Some churches, they have no music. Some do foot washings, some raise hands, some baptize babies. We can have these differences and still be one in Christ. God is the great physician. He cares for us and about us. The Pharisees, they were much more concerned about upholding the laws of Moses, but they showed no compassion or grace to the people that they were supposed to be caring for. Doing work on the Sabbath was strictly forbidden, and Jesus had done work. He made mud with his spit. He anointed the man's eyes. This was a violation of the Sabbath day. 
The Pharisees' only concern was that Jesus worked on the Sabbath, but none felt joy that the blind man could now see after all of his life being blind. Jesus found fault with their interpretation of the law. You see, they were also being hypocrites. Because Jesus knew that they would have pulled their own donkey out of a pit on the Sabbath while condemning others for doing the very same thing. By the way, have you ever noticed the similarities with what God did in Genesis 2? Then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground and breath breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Here's Jesus renewing a man's eyes with clay. God made Adam out of the dust of the earth, and Jesus healed a man's eyes from the dirt of the earth. I thought that was pretty amazing to put those two things together. There is more going on than healing a blind man's eyes. In Isaiah 35, the prophet said that one day the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Jesus' ministry was not to just take away all of our illnesses and our problems. He treats more than the symptoms that we experience. He deals with sin, and he puts people right with God. The blind man is not the only one without sight. There is a pandemic of blindness going on, but it's blindness of a different kind. There are leaders doubting who Jesus is, though they know the old prophecies better than anyone. There's the crowd. They love seeing the miracles that Jesus performed. Some put their faith in him, but others simply walked away. Even the disciples sometimes show a lack of faith. Interestingly, the man whose eyes were just opened, he seems to be the one who can see clearly. Reading his response to the question of the Pharisees shows us that he is growing in awareness about who Jesus is. Even if we have grown up going to church, we need to have our eyes opened to Jesus. We need our spiritual vision restored. It's possible to know a lot about Jesus and his word, yet we can be far away from knowing, really knowing Jesus. That is the real blindness. If knowing and agreeing with what the Bible says remains religious facts, dry concepts, in our mind, simply topics of conversations when we gather, then Jesus is still very distant from us. We know his name, but is there a relationship? Paul prays for believers that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened. Each of us needs enlightened eyes. We are blind to what is real until God opens our eyes. See, there is more to wholeness than physical wholeness, and there is more to vision than eyesight. Knowing Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, you know his name and he knows yours, is when our eyes are truly opened to who Jesus is and how much he loves each and every one of us. Amen.